Rhodes is the largest island of the Dodecanese, a group of Greek islands located in the southeast of the Aegean, just off the west coast of Turkey. Since antiquity, this special location has brought it both power and wealth. On the northernmost tip of the island is the fascinating metropolis of Chora Rhodos, whose harbour entrance was once adorned by the seventh wonder of the world, the Colossus of Rhodes. But the legendary lighthouse has long since gone, and today excursion boats and yachts crowd the island's former trading harbour that has a rich and dramatic past. The well-sheltered Mandraki Harbour is frequented by ferry boats and is also the starting point of many of the island's excursions. Byzantines, Arabs, the Knights of the Order of St. John, Ottomans and Italians, each one influenced the ever-changing history of the island that was first settled here in 400 BC. The Gothic Governor's Palace is of typical Italian design and resembles the Doge's Palace in Venice, but also blends with the Moorish Caliph's Palace. Italian fantasies of the Orient were also realized in the market buildings along the harbour promenade. Here, tourists crowd into the harbour's modern cafes. A small harbour was built at the same time as the ancient city. Three of thirteen original medieval windmills are located on the pier, toward the neighbouring Emborio Harbour, where luxury liners lie at anchor close to the walls of the old town. It is believed that ships once travelled into the harbour through the open legs of the Colossus of Rhodes. Rhodes was one of the most important cities in antiquity and fended off attack thanks to its impressively tall city walls. But the mighty looking fortification was in reality a deception as it was far from sturdy. But its many defensive towers and pinnacles had their desired effect. During this time, a city wall was built, with strong four meter thick walls, towers, defensive walls and ditches, a masterpiece of fortress architecture. One of the most beautiful gates is the Thalassini Gate that dates back to the golden age of chivalry, framed by two huge circular towers and adorned with well-preserved figures of saints that symbolized the loyalty of the knights. Beyond the walls is a unique combination of both medieval and Ottoman architecture, associated with tranquility as well as much hustle and bustle.
pulsating heart of Rhodes is the constantly busy Ippokratu Square. Here, all kinds of souvenirs are offered for sale. Helmets of the gods, vases, busts and icons. Neat stone houses with traditional wooden balconies flank the small lanes through which those who visit the city can enjoy an intriguing and relaxing stroll. Just off the tourist trail, the narrow lanes are suddenly calm and empty. They may seem to be momentarily disorientating, but they usually lead back to the main street. Unexpectedly, hidden squares with small mosques and old prayer towers appear. Here, Gothic elements from the age of chivalry blend with the oriental flair of Turkish mosques and the influence of the free-thinking Greeks. Each step is like a journey through 2,400 years of history. In the Jewish district is the Kal de Shalom synagogue that dates back to the 16th century. It has been fully restored thanks to public donation. The Turkish district also has a lot to offer. It originated after the Turks marched victoriously into the city in 1522 and settled here. The old town of Rhodes is now tantamount to a protected artistic monument. Everything that has survived is well maintained and cared for, and everyone who comes here also treats it with great respect. The impressive remains of the old Gothic church building of Panagia to Burgon is reminiscent of the romantic age of chivalrous and loyal knights. Sometimes it's possible to observe a carpet being made, but this is mainly done to attract the tourists and to encourage them to buy. An interesting sight is the Knights District that in former times was divided by walls from the rest of the city. In 1306, the Knights of the Order of Malta purchased the island. Here, the Order's courageous knights built their main base for the glorious Crusades that were meant to free the Holy Land from the claws of the unbelievers. For more than 200 years, the Grand Master Palace and the Knights Hospital were the island's most important buildings. Today, the Order's well-preserved hospital is open to the general public. Only works of art from the Mycenaean to the Hellenistic Epoch are exhibited here, due to the fact that the Romans took most of its treasures to Rome. Artistic floor mosaics and unique stone sculptures indicate the island's long history. Including stone masks and other valuable objects, and painted vases and pots that have been painstakingly reconstructed from countless fragments.
Not far away is the Inn of the French Knights of Auvergne that was completed under the command of Grand Master Guy de Blanchefort, a building complex that has all the elegance of a Venetian palace. The Street of the Knights leads from the hospital up the hill to the Grand Master Palace, a unique ensemble of Gothic medieval architecture set amid the Mediterranean. The main buildings of the various groups of knights were erected along the main street. It was here that the knights met and conferred according to their membership of various European regions. These inns also accommodated pilgrims on their journey to Jerusalem, who frequently stopped off in roads for a few days' rest. During the time of the Knights of St. John, horsemen and young noblemen gathered here, each wearing the shining red capes and cross of their order. Greeks and Jews were rarely allowed to enter this city within a city, and the Knights left it only two by two and on horseback. At the city's highest point is the huge palace of the Grand Master, the monumental junction of the Street of the Knights and the command post of the Christian Order. In 1320, the Knights of St. John discovered an old fortified town here and immediately began to expand its fortress into the Grand Master Palace. In its present form, the building is a reconstruction of the original palace that was first built on the site of a temple for the Sun King Helios. The Grand Master was the highest dignitary of the Order of the Knights of Malta, a lifetime office. Today, his former residence looks as though it was abandoned only recently. The splendid attire and family charts of the Grand Master indicate the unlimited power and magnificence of this God-fearing knight and ultimate commander. The solemn atmosphere and priceless furnishings of the rooms are most impressive. All this on a small island in the Mediterranean. The view from above this huge inner courtyard gives a true perspective of the dimensions of the huge complex. Here the Middle Ages are still very much alive. The palace of the Grand Master also had much social significance. Those who were permitted to enter here were fully accepted by one and all. Italian traders from Amalfi founded the order in 1070 that was originally dedicated to the care of sick pilgrims and crusaders.
After a total of seven Christian Crusades was unable to defeat Islam and the reconquering of Jerusalem failed, the Knights of the Order of St. John were driven out of Palestine. First, they sought shelter in Cyprus and next conquered the island of Rhodes that was then under the rule of Portuguese pirates. To protect themselves from the Turks as well as from the pirates, the new owners of the island built several strong fortresses. The fortress was transformed into the huge Grand Master Palace and the Knight's warlike fleet was also feared just as much as the pirates. Within the once invisible castle moat, now there are plants and it's also popular with joggers and walkers. The fortified old town is accessible only via high stone bridges. Above a large gate, marble boards and images of angels welcome all those who enter the fortress. In the 15th century, there were three attempts to storm its walls. In 1440 and 1444, the Egyptians failed, and in 1480, the Ottomans. It was subsequently reinforced. Square towers were replaced by circular towers and triple gate complexes had tangled corridors added. Further protection for the fortress. This mighty fortification was thought to be the best strategically designed fortress system in the whole of Europe. Thus, Rhodes was never taken. Socrates Street, that leads up to the Suleiman Mosque, has a very oriental appearance. Following the capture of Rhodes by the Turks, the city was transformed into one that contained many elements of Turkish design. The old Turkish library is situated at the end of a bazaar street with a pleasant courtyard. Next to it is an imposing clock tower that is open to the public. From here, there's a fascinating and overwhelming view of the city. Turkish forced the local population to settle outside the city walls. Fine mosques were built and the medieval structures have been extremely well preserved. Subsequent invasions brought little change for the worse. On the contrary, in 1912 the Italians restored the medieval district. Even the bombing of the island by the Germans in the Second World War caused little damage. The old city of Rome survived.
The British eventually liberated the island and in 1947 it finally integrated with the Greek state. On the hill above the city, the Monte Smith, are the impressive remains of ancient roads, a large stadium and semicircular amphitheatre. But the ruins of the Acropolis are only a shadow of the former splendour of this ancient island metropolis. Thilerimos is located on the island's west coast, close to the city of Rhodes. On a hill, an avenue of pine trees leads to a huge concrete cross. The monastery is an impressive building constructed by the Order of the Knights of Malta. From outside it looks like a single building, but it also contains four chapels. The Crusaders built this complex on historic ground. In the 5th century AD, Byzantine monks built the first chapel on this site. This in turn had been built above the ruins of an ancient acropolis of the autonomous Doric city of Ialysos that existed prior to the origins of the city of Rhodes. The splendid condition of today's monastery and its colourful mosaic illustrations is thanks to the Italians who carried out extensive renovation work here. Tranquil arcades indicate past idyllic monastic life. There is also a story told of a battle with a dragon that the Grand Master duly dispatched. From the surrounding monastery garden, there's a view across the winding bays and beaches of the west coast. Knight's Church covers only a small section of the ancient Athena Polyas Temple, whose massive foundations were only recently uncovered. The interior of the church is adorned with a cross that belonged to the order, and the medieval furnishings highlight the deep religious belief of that period. The cross-shaped baptismal font of the early Christian basilica enabled immersion of the entire body, a custom of the 5th century. The journey travels to the interior of the island. Amid a green wooded mountain landscape is Psynthos, a mountain village with fine houses and village square. The scant landscape smells of herbs and shines out in lush green, a popular destination for those who enjoy nature and want to escape the hordes of holidaymakers on the coast. Even in winter, the climate is good and helps the olive trees to flourish, the ideal climate for this heat-seeking tree. Petaludis, the Valley of the Butterflies, 
For many years, this picturesque location has been a popular attraction for tourists who usually come here in organized groups. A creek that contains water throughout the year flows through a narrow valley and forms romantic waterfalls, cascades and small pools. A steep path with wooden handrails and bridges leads up from the end of the valley. Until some years ago, there were thousands of harlequin butterflies to be seen here between July and September. These nocturnal creatures come here to breed in the humid biotope atmosphere of this valley, to the aromatic resin of its sweet gum trees whose nearest counterparts grow on the coast of Asia Minor. Close by, this isolated place hides a gem of Byzantine art the Agios Nikolaos Funtukli Church. The interior of the church is adorned with colourful frescoes. Various scenes feature the holy sacraments and also infants in paradise. A Byzantine functionary built this isolated church in commemoration of his children who succumbed to the plague. Bumpy narrow streets lead up through a wooded area. The adventurous journey across the island has begun. The road gradually winds its way to the east of the island. Eptar Piges, the Valley of the Seven Springs. The Romans appreciated the coolness of this region during the hot summer months. Legend has it that this was once a favorite haunt of nymphs, a fantasy that's quite easy to believe. The clear water of the Seven Springs forms a small creek that trickles its way beneath the dense leafy canopy of ancient plane trees. It's hardly surprising that this wonderful setting also allures ducks that float relaxingly and carefree on the water. Here nature flourishes and there are several varieties of orchid whose appearance, colour and scent lures countless insects to their delicate blossoms. Finally, we reach the east coast and Sambika Bay. At the foot of Tsambika mountain, there's a small church. One of many churches 
that are scattered across the island and belong in the main to the larger monasteries. The Greek Orthodox Church and its nuns, monks and patriarchs have helped to preserve the region's language and culture. Ancient culture, tradition and the simple life are still highly respected here. During the ascent of Tambika Mountain, the view becomes increasingly spectacular. Deep below is an expansive, picturesque bay and sandy beaches. At the end of the steep path, there's a small white church that is part of Tambika Monastery. Exposed to the elements, it sits high on a rock. Mountains, coastline and beaches are the colourful and attractive setting for this monastery. The nuns left their tiny church long ago, but their place of worship has remained. Feraklos Hill is an imposing site. Originally, the Byzantines built a large fortress on its summit. In 1306, the Knights of the Order of St. John conquered this fortress and subsequently enlarged it. An additional wall was added because of the threat of invasion by the Ottoman Empire. This wall has been particularly well preserved, including some of the towers of the fortress that is still an impressive sight and gives an insight into its former dimensions. A bay that glimmers in all the shades of blue. A group of shining white houses, protected by a mighty mountain and a castle. Lindos, the most beautiful village in Rhodes, with Paulus Bay and an Acropolis that is located high above the sea. Thanks to the preservation of its ancient monuments, this place has managed to survive. Labyrinth-like narrow lanes travel through an array of white houses. Houses that once belonged to sea captains indicate the wealth of the village's inhabitants with classical entrances and decorations. Leading up to the castle are narrow alleys and steps that in the summer months become crowded with more than a million sightseers. After an arduous climb of 116 metres, a few steep steps finally lead to the entrance of the castle. Lindos Castle was first built by the Byzantines, but in 1312 the Order of the Knights of Malta almost completely rebuilt it. Following a successful battle against the Turks, the Grand Master of the Order, Pierre d'Aubusson, 
had a palace built within the castle. In 1936, Italian archaeologists began to rebuild the temple's columns and concreted the terrace. The optical effect is most impressive. From here, the white houses of the village appear like toys. More about the temple's renovation. The inclusion of iron, inferior sandstone and concrete had disastrous results. Thus the ancient ruins had to be strengthened. The iron was replaced with stone and the columns were given additional support. Many who come here wander above the scattered stones, oblivious to the ancient buildings that were once here. The Long Hall, the Large Steps and Johannes Church. This magnificent setting is the most beautiful photographic opportunity that the Greek island has to offer. Bulwark of the West in a strategic location. A structure with a thousand years of history. Overwhelming, mighty and unique. A donkey taxi makes for a very comfortable descent. The docile animals carry sightseers up and down the steep mountain paths. A shining white chapel, beyond it the blue sea and a shining sky with small white clouds. Romantic and picture book perfect. Or Greece at its best. In ancient times Lindos was a powerful and rich maritime and trading centre, with its own shipyards. Sicilian colonies and the first official maritime right in the world. All this thanks to its natural harbour that is today mainly full of sand and serves as a popular bathing beach. Ferry boats constantly travel to and fro, transporting those who wish to experience this place of antiquity and the golden age of chivalry. Further south are the ruins of Asclepio Castle, surrounded by the rugged and fascinating natural landscape. The remains of the walls of a medieval castle of the Knights of the Order of St. John lie amid the isolated mountain landscape. The imposing ruins are a reminder of once hostile times. Some of the castle's surviving corridors are an indication of the interior. It's an interesting and accessible place, but not without its dangers.
from here, there's a wonderful view across the wide and remote valley that leads to the sea and whose riverbed dries out in the summer months. Few tourists venture to this picturesque mountain region and only a few roads travel through its rural landscape. We travel by car across the mountains to the island's west coast. The route travels higher and higher and becomes increasingly precarious. In the fields of the barren highlands, sheep provide a living for the local people. Isolated mountain villages lie scattered across the landscape. The modest village of Mesanagros is located high in the Kukuliari mountains. Narrow lanes dominate this simple, unspoilt village. The car journey through the wild mountain terrain becomes increasingly adventurous and the spectacular landscape even more isolated and extreme. Suddenly and surprisingly is the village of Siana that consists of few houses but boasts a large Neo-Byzantine church. Its towers and domes are in strong contrast with the nearby small houses of the village and time really has stood still in Siana as the clock face is only painted on. As in other similar old churches, huge crystal chandeliers hang down from the ceiling and icons and sacred objects decorate the interior. From time to time, tourists come to this beautiful village and are able to purchase local pine tree honey and wool. A short drive along a winding mountain road and we arrive at the rocky west coast. The end of the road, the end of the island. This is the end of the central mountain range that stretches across the island. It slopes down steeply into the sea. On a single rock is the impregnable crusader fortress of Monolithos. At first sight, the fortress appears to be inaccessible, but from below there are steps that lead up to the grandiose building that was also built by Grand Master Orbison. The small church situated at the top of the rock continues to be maintained to the present day and contains a very special atmosphere. The unique panoramic
panoramic view across the entire west coast and the rocky bay deep below helps one to understand the power and influence of the Order of the Knights of St. John. The journey north leads inland to Cretinia, and also here amid this remote mountain landscape are the ruins of an ancient fortress. A ruined yet impressive fortress of the Crusaders is located on a rock ledge. The Order of the Knights of St. John built a single structure here in 1309. The towers and walls were added later. Thanks to its excellent strategic location, 75 kilometers of coastline were once surveyed from here. The Minoans are believed to have been the first settlers in this region and they named their new home after their original home of Crete. The calm landscape is wonderfully silent and legend has it that it was here that the sun god Helios once kissed the nymph Rhode. The imagination can easily run riot in this fascinating landscape. The road finally travels down to the sheltered slopes of the coast, where flowers and vegetables are grown commercially in greenhouses and supply the city of Rhodes. The small fishing harbour of Camiros Scala consists of a tavern and a small number of houses. Fishing boats lie at anchor in the harbour, waiting for the next trip out to sea. From here, the ferry to Chalki always embarks promptly, even when the sea is less than calm. A few kilometres north along the coast, and the smallest of the three ancient cities of Rhodes, appears from within a sweet-smelling forest of pine trees. Ancient Camiros was only discovered in 1859 by farmers who came across some graves here. But many of the objects that they discovered were stolen. Thus today there are only the remains of the original foundations. But within them it's possible to discern streets, baths and temple areas. This glimpse into the past makes Hellenistic history come alive once more. This masterpiece of ancient city planning is one of the most important archaeological sites on the island of Rhodes. The residential district extends within a narrow valley. The houses had a subterranean water supply that relied upon gravity. The distant view to the west coast made this once powerful city an exclusive residential area, as one would call it today. Devastating earthquakes repeatedly destroyed the city 
until its inhabitants finally gave in and left this wonderful place. The calm sound of the waves is like medicine for the soul, and along with the heat of the sun, makes it easy to forget the problems of everyday life. It was here that the sun was born, and where God, knights and tourists have always sought good fortune. Rhodes, an island that bewitches all who experience it.